All right, we're live. Welcome to the Couch GM podcast. Today we're doing a live episode. We're talking the downfall of the Pac-12. <clears throat> Looks like Dylan just fell off there. He'll be back in a second. But it happens. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much you've looked into it, Will, but I really dug deep into what was going on yesterday. Dylan mm. caught me up a bit on what was going on. And WSU, OSU were awarded a temporary restraining order against the Pac-12 and the Pac-12 commissioner uh, because apparently the rest of the Pac-12 was going to be meeting tomorrow, Wednesday, to amend some of the bylaws to allow them to have more control on the assets and the revenue that are coming out of the Pac-12. And so, Dylan, if you want to start off on kind of what the situation is with the Pac-12, what's going on there? Yeah, you know, so essentially Oregon State and, and Washington State have, for the most part, you know, been left out of uh, the dinner table um, when it comes to, um, you know, major universities. Uh, but, you know, when it comes down to it, it's the TV networks that are pushing everything here. ESPN, Fox, um, the Big Ten, they made the first splash. Well, actually, it was the SEC that made the first splash with Oklahoma and Texas um you know announcing i i think probably two years ago um correct me if i'm wrong and then that kind of just started off a chain of reaction where all right ucla and usc got nabbed by the big 10 in order to you know hey they got to have teams on that west coast timeline um for viewership you know the 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 pac-12 after dark um and right that kind of set into motion everything else where uh, the Pac-12 for the last year since UCLA and, UC and USC have left have been trying to mitigate and manage this sinking ship that is now essentially sunk. Um, and it, it took uh, GK, George Kikolov, um, too much time to put together some sort of media deal, which we end up, you know, we now know was through Apple and, and streaming and, um, you know, ended up being around 20, 21 million. And it could, it was a horrible deal. It, it was really based on incentives and you were just never going to hit any of the incentives. Um, they were talking like you could maybe get to 25 million, 30 million a year. If you were hitting NFL red zone numbers, like no offense, you're just not hitting those NFL red zone numbers for Pac-12 football. I don't know if the sec could hit it and there's nothing to do in the South, but watch football. Right. So you were never going to touch those numbers of the Pac-12 in general. But Dylan, I'd actually make the argument that this didn't get kicked off with, you know, Texas and Oklahoma. I'd make the argument this was 12 years ago when you went and got Utah, Colorado, because let's not forget, you had an opportunity to get Oklahoma and Texas. And I think you were going to end up getting Texas Tech and Baylor. You were going to become the first 16 team super conference. But yeah. You balked at Texas getting their own tv network you didn't want to give that to texas and then the other big issue was you know larry scott and his whole crew they were like well we're academic institutions we want true student athletes we want to think about the other sports it's not just about football and really that's where you start to see the fall like this is the demise because instead of valuing a money-making sport like football you valued water polo you know swimming volleyball soccer and i'm not here to attack those sports right i i love those sports i coached you know some of those sports but when you put a value in those when they aren't the real money makers especially in most institutions if not all none of those sports make any money you fell behind the eight ball because you gave the sec and the big 10 time where they saw where the true money was at and they could go out and make a play on these teams and they yeah. nabbed them yeah, and, and going back 10, 12 years ago, it, there was two major institutions that balked at it. It was USC and Stanford yes. did not want uh, a merger with Texas. And then what ESPN did is ESPN gave the Longhorn Network to Texas. So that was also a big crutch um, in, in kind of screwing up. But obviously Larry, Larry Scott was a disaster. Um, his TV deal was a disaster um and, that was disaster but but the presidents every president in the pac-12 enabled this as well mm -hmm. so yeah. this 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 was a collective fall for the pacific 12 conference 
Um, but yeah, I mean, essentially just kind of going back to, to, you know, where we're at in terms of the injunction and the, um, gosh, sorry for it's escaping my mind. It's like a stay, I think it's a, it's a stay so that nothing in the pac 12 can continue. If I was a restraining order, that's what I'm looking for. So, you know, it's essentially OSU and WSU are the only ones not to abandon ship. And now the armada of fleeing dinghies are, are trying to turn around because they forgot to pillage the ship before they left. Um, so that's that's essentially Great. kind of what we're looking at right now. You know, there's still John Canzano, um, um, a, a credible writer who's been kind of following this whole thing for the last um, year plus says he, he thinks there's anywhere from 150 to $200 million worth of assets still left in the PAC 12. And when we're looking at these certain assets, we're looking at NCA tournament units. We're looking at what the PAC 12 network is worth. Each NCA tournament unit last year was $2 million. And what an NCA tournament unit is, is a game. So essentially mm-hmm. they had um, five Pac-12 teams make the, the tournament last season. So off the bat, the conference got $10 million for having five NCAA tournament units. They ended up finishing with seven, um, with, I believe, $14 million. Um, so this year, you know, hey, if you have five teams make it again, let's say all five make sweet 16 runs, you have the upwards of 25 to $30 million in NCAA tournament units that would stick with the conference. So essentially what WSU and and OSU are trying to do is what determines um, uh, a a university uh, is an August 4th deadline of 2024. Um, I don't know if you can kind of help brush up there, Connor, in terms of um, what validates a public – view of uh, saying, hey we're, we're leaving the pac 12 because every school has posted uh their their invite and their new logo whether it's U- ucla and usc um colorado with the big 12 but there's also precedent here and i'm kind of all over the place i apologize but the pre- the precedent is where once ucla and usc left gk and the pac 12 halted all of their voting rights going through the bylaws right right and they did the same with colorado right so so what they have here so i I just pulled it up this is on the spokane review um so the pac-12 conference bylaws state that you lose your position on the pac-12 board if you say that you are leaving the conference before august 1st of 2024 so at some point all of these other teams other than OSU and WSU have gone out and tweeted that they are leaving. They have made a statement that they are leaving and going to a new school. Um, They've done interviews about leaving athletic directors, presidents, whole nine yards. Everyone knows that they are leaving. What their argument is going to have to be in court is we have said we're leaving, but we haven't given you an official notice. If anyone was paying attention or remembers, San Diego state wrote an official notice to the Mountain West that they were gonna leave because there was a thought before Colorado left that the Pac-12 was gonna go snag SMU and San Diego State and bring them into the Pac-12, one, so they could stay the Pac-12, but in their mind, strengthen, right? San Diego State, you get that Southern California viewership that you would lose from USC, UCLA. Obviously, you would never get that back, but that was kind of the claim there. And then you would get that, uh, you'd get your Texas school, you'd get the Dallas market. So that was kind of the idea that some Pac-12 commissioner, or sorry, that some Pac-12 presidents had, that they were going to bring in these two areas and they'd get a better TV rights deal. Now, obviously, that all went to kaput when Colorado announced that they were leaving. That led to Oregon and Washington making their decision to leave and so on and so forth. But the reason that these teams are going to fight for it that already left is because a lot of them factored this money into them leaving. Because if you look at how much money most of these teams are getting, it's not a full TV rights deal, right? So USC, UCLA, they're getting the full Big Ten money. I think it's around $60 million a year, if I'm correct on that. But when you look at Oregon and UW, they're going to the Big Ten as well, but they're only getting around $40 million. So it would be a big help for them if they could get the remainder of this Pac-12 money. You look at Stanford and Cal, to my knowledge, Stanford and Cal, they're not getting any money for like four or five years in the ACC. 
before they even come in. So for a lot of these schools that are leaving, they want slash kind of need this money to be able to make this move and at least make the move easier for the first couple of years when you have to add in all these new travel costs. Well, Oregon State and Washington State, they don't want to give them this money because if they hold on to this money and they hold on to the Pac-12 name and brand, there's talk that the brand of the Pac-12 is actually a bigger money-making asset than the Mountain West. So Oregon State and Washington State can then go to teams in the Mountain West. They can go to teams in Conference USA, Sun Belt, whatever they want, and say, come on and come join us. Come up from the big sky. Come join the Pac-12, and we'll get a better media rights deal than the Mountain West would get, which is only at $6 million. Now, they're not going to try and claim that, hey, we can get you all the way to you know Big Ten money or Big 12 money or shoot even ACC money, but we can get a better deal than the Mountain West and we'll become the big power conference, not in the new power four, right? And if they can do that, it makes it easier, one, for them to get into the playoffs, but it makes them more relevant again, because if you don't think we're going to go through conference realignment in another couple of years, that's going to come again. And so teams are seeing what SMU did now, a team that was clearly on the outside looking in. They were a group of five team, and they just got a bunch of their oil money donors, and they said, we are going to find our way to a seat at the table, whether that's with the Pac-12 or ACC or Big 12, whoever is willing to let us in, we are going to force our way in. And now what you can do is you can bide your time in the Mountain West and hope that maybe there's a chance when we realign, you can try and force your way in. No, no doubt. Um, you know, but I think it also comes down to it where it, it just shows the greediness of these other 10 Pac-12 schools where mm -hmm. they are factoring in getting resolution money from the dissolve, uh, you know, from, from the conference dissolving. Um, it's like you, you, you can't take your cake and eat it. Um, is right. where OSU and WSU are coming from. And yeah, you know, obviously the Mountain West is getting a, a $6 million uh, a year, um, uh, you know, media TV rights type deal. and media rights deal. You know, if you can figure out a way, okay, you, you pull in a reverse merger with Mountain West where essentially the entire Mountain West conference decides to vote to dissolve where there's going to be no exit mm -hmm. fees. Um, and you kind of take those schools where you're looking at, Colorado State, um, San Diego State, Fresno State, um, Boise State, Boise State as your kind of premier schools there. But um, the other aspect too is that not, this is far from over. Like you can't believe one thing that presidents are saying, that TV networks are saying, that conference commissioners are saying, because. Who knows what the plan is for OSU and WSU right now? They are working tightly and jointly together, and the the goal still should be getting into the Big 12. If you can parlay that and win something in court where, hey, maybe you come to a resolution where, hey, we keep the Pac-12 network in the name of WSU, OSU, a certain amount of tournament credits, you, get, you also give the 10 departing schools, there's going to be litigation. Where, where they get a piece of the of the pie, but if you can offer Big Twelve a network, also all the history of all the old games, every every broadcast um, that the, the Pac twelve network has, you could possibly get in with the ESPN just prorated twenty one mm -hmm. million a year because ESPN has that um, offered. Any school that the Big Twelve will add will will automatically get that twenty one million. It's just going to be Fox. Um, that's probably going to say uh, no to WSU and OSU, but at this point, you got to do what you can to get a seat at the table. And even if, and we see with Cal and Stanford what they did, taking eight million for I believe the first seven or eight years before their right. their um, their media rights gets bigger. Right. Yeah. Well, sorry, go for it, Connor. Oh, I was, I was just going to go off on a tangent, you know, saying um, I'm I'm curious if what universities actually gave a formal notice, if any of them. And if they didn't, then they've done everything outside of sending a formal email stating that they're leaving the conference. Because as we already mentioned, all these universities have already posted across social medias, you know, USC and UCLA started back in 2022 that they were leaving. The most recent Cal and, or, uh, Cal and Stanford were voted into the ACC as recently as September 1st, I believe. And so all the all 10 of those schools 
the new conferences are like, Hey, they're joining us. They're like, we're joining that. But now be, after the fact, they're wanting to, you know, have the voting rights. I'm curious if they're trying to vote and amend the bylaws for the revenue from this year, or if it's for the revenue for the future years. And if they really are, if they kind of just assumed that the PAC 12 was just going to fall apart. So we have to divide it all because it's going to be gone. Well, Hey, WCU and OSU still own it. So they're the, the, the only voting members, but I'm just curious, did they really not think Did the lawyers for those universities really not think out like, Hey, maybe before we send this tweet, we should send an email to officially resign, or we should hold on this until this specific date. Um, another thought is that with the date in the bylaws being August of 2024, if they would have to officially announce it, like around that time, they would only have, you know, a couple months, a month to get everything in order with the new conference for the next season. So that's kind of a gray area, but yeah, I'm just curious exactly what they're trying to fight over, what bylaws they're trying to amend in this case. And really WCU and OSU has all the, all the control, it seems. I would think that there's like some legalese in there where it's like, well, technically we didn't actually formally let you know. So technically we get to sneak in and we get to still have control because what these conference or what these teams want to do to the conference is they want to dissolve it. Cause if they dissolve it, then you have to evenly split it between all the teams that have dissolved it. If Oregon state and Washington state can hold on to it, then they would get to split the money between the two of them. And it ends up being pretty similar. And to my understanding money wise for about two years, which is how long, they can keep the conference, just the two teams. They get a similar amount of money each year to around what Oregon and Washington were getting in the Big Ten, which is about 40-ish million dollars. And that's a huge deal when you want to start throwing money around to try and, one, get teams to come back into the Pac-12 or get new teams to come into the Pac-12. But it's also huge. Like, we all know Washington State's in debt. This could be a lot of money and help them pay off a lot of renovations they just made. Oregon State, they just renovated a lot of their athletic facilities, including Research Stadium. This can be huge towards that. But you're also looking at the possibility of that money can overpay for some of your coaches to get them to stay. Let's call a spade a spade right now. What's happening with Jonathan Smith at Oregon State and what's happening with Dickert at WSU is some of the most impressive coaching jobs in all of college football right now but i'm sticking i'm sticking with them specifically because that's where my background and my, my base knowledge is but you can't tell me that if wsu and osu go into the mountain west and all of a sudden there isn't a chance to go into the playoff you can't tell me that now that you know that crappy northwestern job that crappy nebraska job or you know you want to go coach at smu not really but they're in a big conference they can lure away dicker they can lure away smith and if they take those guys who deserve to be coaching in power five football, that's going to take away probably 25% of those rosters with guys either going with them to the new school, or it's going to take guys going to other schools, entering that transfer portal, especially with the new NCAA rule of, you don't, you know, your first time transfer, you don't have to sit out at all. And that can make it a little bit of the wild west. If I'm, you know, an Aiden Childs type of player or shoot, even Cam Ward guys who, you have most of your career steer still in front of you, or at least half of it in Ward's case. Why would I stay at WSU? I have an outside shot if we go undefeated and we run the table that maybe I get to go get the, you know, break speed off me by Alabama in Tuscaloosa for a 12 versus four matchup or 12 versus five matchup. However, they're planning to do it in the 12 team. Or you're telling me I can do, you know, what like Jaden Daniels did. I can go to LSU. I can go to Mississippi State, Kentucky. I can go to one of these new schools. My coach from my old college, they're going to come with me. If they're taking me, they're going to make me a starter. I'm going to go to that school, right? If yeah. you don't have those TV right money like the big boys do, your NIL gets smaller. So now you can't keep some of the players that you already have had. So it's a huge deal. Or OSU and WSU need to fight tooth and nail because – Honestly, they're being very re reactionary in this. When USC and UCLA left, they should have done what SMU did. It's a great article. Go read. It's Ross Dillinger, I believe, is who wrote it. But SMU, the minute that realignment talks started happening, SMU went to all their donors and said, you need to give us money because if we want to get into real football, we want to get into a Power 5 conference, Power 4 conference, 
we need you guys to give us money that can offset some of the TV rights money that we're not going to get if we want to get into these conferences. That's how they got into the ACC. They're getting no money till 2030. Yet they have donors who are saying, I don't care. I, you know, I get oil. I'm making millions upon millions of dollars a year. Have my money. And that's why they are in the haves and OSU and WSU are in the have nots right now. Yeah, but I make an argument too. Or OSU and WSU have always been at a, a a bit of a crutch when it comes to the Pac-12. Their right. recruiting does not change if it goes into the Mountain West Conference. It's the same style of recruiting. You're finding your, your your two stars, your three stars, and you're turning them into all right. Hey, you're you're gray shirting, you're red shirting, um, and those two and three stars end up being starting football players two three years down the line. NIL also just with everything that's going on, Cougars and OSU, they don't have the donorship right now where they're able to get this money. The reason we do have Cam Ward is because of our Cougar Collective. We we went out and we found out a, a diamond in the rough, a guy that had zero football offers that was running a wing T offense in high school. Those are the guys that they have to hit on. And that's what they did with Cam Ward. He's going to go to the NFL after this year. He's done. This this is his final year with WSU. I mean, but he does have the 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 opportunity with the NIL landscape to to go wherever he wants. Um, yeah. But you know, in, in terms of uh, you know, I, uh, taking a look at just some TV ratings as as we go last year, th- th- there's this there's this idea that pull that everybody thinks it's just a Pullman and Spokane TV market. There are so many Cougs that are in. The Seattle area, the the Portland area. We've got a campus in Vancouver. I mean, they they did two point three million on ABC, and they were fighting against uh, Texas and Alabama, as well as Oregon and Texas Tech. They put up numbers. They've been in the top six, top half of the Pac-12 for the last seven to eight years. Mike Leach resurrected the program, and there is plenty of viewership base. Um, in the Pacific Northwest Forum, but I think when it comes down to and being left out is they don't have the donor money um, that a lot of these other schools have in terms of Daddy Phil with Oregon. Um, let's be real. You don't have Daddy Phil at Oregon. You're the same as us at WSU. But in this landscape, it's all who you know, who you have, and you know if you have the CEO of Nike, you're going to get your foot in the door anywhere. Right. It's, it's also your main uh, media market, right? So Eugene's a not these, a media market, you know? So, like, we no, can go but, with that. But here's the, here's the thing with Eugene is you get Portland. And Portland's just outside of the top 20 or top 25 market. It's not it, – it, it sucks because, yes, you are right. WSU just, definitely has people – WSU in Seattle. It, it's, it's not quite because Seattle is you dub. That's what Seattle is. If WSU and OSU go into the Mountain West, you will see that viewership regression, or at least that's what those media rights companies, ESPN, Fox, that's what they think are going to happen. Now, we, you know, those guys could be completely off base. But when you look at Oregon viewership and Oregon numbers, a lot of that comes from them getting the Portland market because they do technically get the Portland media market. Um, I mean, I'm looking at Chris, Chris Daniels, um, you know, posted, you know, talk for all the talk about Mark. This is from his tw- uh, ex for all the talk about market size in Washington State University. The WSU Wisconsin game delivered monster ratings in Seattle market, right. ending with an 8.3 out of 32 share in total households and a 45 share in demographics, 18 to 49, which is three different demographics and the three you want to be in. You know, in terms of the 18 to 29, 29 to 30, 40 to 50. Um, so I, I just don't buy that. Um, there's plenty of alums and plenty of cougs that live in the Seattle market. Yes, it's it's UW's market too, but in my opinion, I think it's both. Um, they're both a gigantic universities. Right. And they are big. They're big universities, but look, man, there's a reason it's UW. They, these people get paid a lot of money. I hate it too. I grew up an Oregon State fan. That's where I wanted to go. Uh, actually, until about high school when I wanted to go to WSU because you had the Edward R. Murrow program, right? Um, it, it just sucks. It's the, it's the lay of the land. What frustrates me is 
this didn't catch anyone off guard. Anyone who says you got caught off guard, you're lying. USC and UCLA might have caught people off guard, but you've had a year, year and a half to come up with plans to counteract this at Oregon State and Washington State. Here's the thing. There was never a wonder of, like, who was going to be left out in the cold. It was always going to be Washington State and Oregon State. You know, when you look at Colorado, Colorado's not a good program. But guess what? They're in Boulder. They got the Denver market. Denver is right there. They're always going to jump them. UW is literally in Seattle. Unfortunately, UW is going to get that. Look, man, I know Corvallis is closer to Portland than Eugene is. And, yes, of course, it does help that you have Uncle Phil and Nike. But that also helps you get in the door into Portland. When you walk around Portland, when you look at TV viewership in Portland, it's not Oregon State. It's Oregon over Portland State. It just is what it is. USC and UCLA, they get snagged because they're in L.A. Heck, the Big Ten didn't even really want UCLA. They just had to take them along because they were already grabbing USC. You needed to have even numbers. The team there you wanted was USC because they run L.A. So – When it all comes down to it, these big media markets or these big companies that are looking at big media markets, they're going to take who they think are going to do the most viewership over the years. No, like if if we look at this in five years from now and WSU and OSU end up in the Mountain West, do we really think that WSU and OSU are going to start beating Oregon and UW in those markets? Do we think they're going to do better views? WSU for sure got a better viewership. You were a marquee game. You were a big deal game this week do you do it consistently that's my question because i kind of think no and one tweet that i see real real quick one tweet that i see here what are the measurements of programs worth winning games wsu is number five in wins of the pac-12 since 2015 Mm -hmm. tv ratings wsu is number six in tv ratings in the same time period tv market size this tweet set here says that 67 percent of wsu alums are from seattle um, other than location, WSU has outperformed half the Pac-12. So I'm kind of curious if it really is the viewership and the winning and all that stuff, or if it's just because it might be a little more difficult to convince recruits to come out to Pullman and the wheat fields or to Corvallis versus to go wear the shiny uniforms in Eugene or you know be in a big city like UW. I'm curious what those factors play into all this. Yeah, uh, th- and, and like Will said earlier, this is this is not – this is just the the uh, the tip of the iceberg for realignment. The ACC could blow up any year. Yeah, Florida State, Miami, North Carolina, Virginia, Clemson. Clemson. A lot of these schools had wanted no part of Stanford, SMU, and um, Cal coming in. But you know, you, you take a look at, at at these land grant schools that are similar to Washington State, Kansas State in Manhattan. I mean, right. Iowa State in Ames. There could be a land grant conference in five to ten years, where all these schools that are mm-hmm. like each other—a uh, Kansas State, a Washington State, an Oregon State—will get together in bed per se. Um, but I, I, I just, you know, winning numbers, big time head coaches. We take a look at what Mike Leach did, WSU seven straight um, bowl games. The numbers don't lie, and they haven't lied for the last seven to eight years in terms of WSU outperforming, and they do this every year, outperforming what their weight is. Obviously, they're a low-weight team when you you take a look at it from that spectrum as opposed to UW being there in Seattle and and having the prestige um, in in Oregon now. Um, But – you know, I think WSU and Oregon State just have to fight for themselves and fight tooth and nail um, with the Pac-12 conference in enabling themselves to survive um, over the next two to seven years in, in terms of when this next realignment process happens again and, and be able to jump back into the table. But um, I, I disagree, you know, in terms of market share and, and, and ratings. Um, now, obviously, hey, you got to be good and you got to be winning uh, football games consistently and a drop off to the mountain West, you know, could see that, but I, you know, you're telling me right now if the, they do a reverse more merger with the mountain West into the pac 12 or they become the mountain West that 
OSU and WSU aren't dominating that conference, and especially with college football expansion, now having 12 teams. I mean, we saw this past year. Cincinnati got in with four. So mm -hmm. yeah. there is the ability to make it into um, – and, and, and I don't want to hear it from our president, Kirk Schultz, if, if he said this too, is there is an easier path to the college football playoff. But, um, you know, we'll go from there. Right. Uh, yeah, no, th this text coming in playing on the Pac-12 network constantly hurts schools' TV numbers 100%. That's, that's Larry Scott. Larry Scott put you on a TV network that only Comcast not members got, right? Or you had to pay for the – for the uh, the stupid app, the app didn't work. So there's a lot of failure. Larry, look, at the end of the day, the main culprit is Larry Scott. I mean, when you were getting your last TV rights deal, it was pretty decent compared to what everyone else was getting. The problem is you were paying 13 schools. You go, well, that's wrong. There's 12 schools in the Pac-12. Here's the truth though. You were paying for Larry Scott to have an office in San Francisco, downtown San Francisco. There's no other conference that pays for that. He was making, I believe, somewhere in the two to three million dollars a year range. The SEC commissioner makes a eight hundred thousand. Yeah. So, and it also, it also comes down to every year the Pac-12 tournament was in Vegas. Larry Scott was in the 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 best possible hotel. I don't know the top rank hotels, but they called him Limo Larry, um, and, and yes. he got the name for a reason. And obviously, it was an absolute disaster, like you just said, Will, to have the Pac-12 studios in San Francisco. The amount of money you're paying for rent, whatever it may be, to to have a, a studio there, um, you know. So, I completely uh, uh, agree on that aspect. But there's this East Coast bias and this bias of nobody can watch Pac-12 football. Yes, you can. You, you sign up for right. Fubo. Sign up. There's there's plenty of streaming opportunities. When I see people tweet to try and uh, drag down the Pac-12 and oh I can't watch their football games, that's not true. There's there's plenty of a, a ability to be able to 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 stream Pac-12 football. Go whether to a bar. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know you sign up for Fubo. You know it's mm -hmm. forty nine ninety nine a month. You get every Pac-12 game. I don't want to hear the fact that I can't watch Pac-12 football or Pac-12 network. Yes, you can. People just try to try to 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 poop on it. Well, and how much of it is, is is the time zone thing also? And that's honestly why I could never live on the East Coast because then right. you'd be staying up super late to watch the West Coast teams. And so, unless the Pac-12 or the West Coast teams are going to be playing earlier in the day, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and that's the other thing. You, you don't want to play earlier in the day. A nine o'clock game for a for a Pac-12 football player. If I was playing a twelve o'clock game, and this is at Central Washington, I was at breakfast at six thirty, seven o'clock team breakfast. So that means I'm getting ready for the game at six thirty, seven o'clock, latest seven thirty. Like I'm in meetings going through plays for a twelve o'clock game. So what does that look for a nine o'clock game? You got to be a, on the field and you start doing your warm ups an hour and a half before the game. So you're looking at 7.30, you're on the field running around. You still got to do meetings, taping, rehab, stuff like that before. So you're looking at entering the facility at the latest, like 4 o'clock in the morning. That's that, just not that's happening. That's insane. No, it, it doesn't make sense. And and not not to beat a dead horse here or anything like that, but I just I went back and I looked at the revenue. And to me, this is where it sticks out. You dub in 20... 2022-2023, they made $153 million in revenue. Oregon, oh, sorry, that was Oregon. Washington made $145 million in revenue. WSU made $85 million. Oregon State made 83 I think that's just what a lot of those TV networks are looking at. It's what is your revenue base? And it sucks because, you know, you, you guys might be right, and I might be off base here, and WSU pulls better numbers, and Oregon State pulls better numbers than – other teams in the conference and you know what when colorado sucked i bet they did but now that colorado is good or at least halfway decent and they have dion they're the most watched college football team in the country so what i think a lot of these tv networks are going to do is they're going to look at the 20 to 30 year averages and unfortunately tv wise it doesn't even matter what you're putting on the field it just matters what money you are getting back to the school and the university oregon state and wsu are just at the bottom 
to pivot a little bit, um, the NCAA bylaws state that a, a conference has to have eight teams, but there's a two year grace period. So mm-hmm. what's it look like? How realistic is it that, okay, maybe it's the pack two. Maybe it's kind of like they're somewhat independent to where they're building their own schedules the next two years. And if they're well, able to get a decent schedule, they're both, you know, high win teams. They're in the playoffs. Like they're that supposed like? this possible written handshake agreement that the Mountain West Conference, Oregon State, and WSU will have a scheduling. Um, I, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, where they're going to help each other out. Um, yeah. yeah. With scheduling, if the Pac-2 are trying to go through that process of a two-year grace period, but then it's you know what are you doing with every other sport as well, though in in, in that case too. So um, you know that's 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 something um, you know a can of worms that's we're gonna figure out as far as this court case goes um, because it's gonna be a judge determining whether. Um, the other 10 schools and their public Twitter notices, even though it wasn't as Will said earlier with San Diego state, when they did write their formal notice um, it's, it's going to be up to the judge um, to, to decipher if those 10 schools actually gave a formal notice through public, uh, you know, media. But um, unfortunately I, I have to, uh, uh, get going out of here. Um, and I appreciate the time jumping on, uh, with you, Connor, Will, great stuff. Um, good talking to you, man. Um, you know, I'm sure we're going to be, uh, talking about this soon in the, in the same type of live format, um, that we have going for us, but, um, crazy times, obviously we got going on right now on the West coast. So, um, appreciate the time guys. Yeah. Thanks for joining Dylan. Yeah. We'll see you again soon. Hey bud. Now, kind of going off of that, um, what was I going to say here? Um, I, just to answer your yeah. your question about the Pac-12 or Pac-2, I, I think yep. that's what they would prefer. I think if they win this deal, they're going to keep it the Pac-2 because you get two years to try and find a better plan. And right now, that's what OSU and WSU need to do. They need to create time so that they can find a better plan or you know hope that maybe they can – use that money to sneak their way into another conference. The problem is I don't think it's going to happen because when you look at, you know, Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, ACC, there are a bunch of teams that don't deserve to be where they're at. You can't tell me that WSU and OSU aren't better programs historically than some of them. Does Northwestern deserve to get a seat at the table? No. Does Rutgers? Does Vanderbilt? Purdue? You know, you start going down the list of teams, some of these guys don't deserve opportunities, but they're going to get opportunities because their conference had the foresight to see what was happening and be the ones who made the moves instead of sitting around and being reactionary, right? And so when when I look at this, I think OSU and WSU have to make a play here on, can we be the powerhouses in the next conference that we go to? Can we use this money? to hopefully increase the monetary value of the next conference that we go to when it comes to a media rights deal. But can we also use this money to load up on players, get a lot of guys in here? You know, there was a run there where Boise State, I mean, shoot, they were New Year's Six Bowls. They they were in Rose Bowls. They they were New a years powerhouse in a row. conference, right? Utah, they they used it they use their skill in the mountain West and being one of the top teams in the mountain West to get into the PAC 12 and now get into the big 12. Like they keep using it to jump up and jump up and jump up. Now I I think you get to a point where eventually it becomes two super conferences. Maybe there's a third, but I highly doubt it. It's going to turn into really the big 10 and the sec and who got into those is going to be who survives. I, they're not going to want, you're right. The big 10 ACC, big 12, they're not going to want you. So can you be the leaders in the Mountain West? And if you are leaders in the Mountain West, do you get a seat at the next playoff? Because if you can make it so there's an automatic team from Mountain West, Sun Belt, Conference USA, you know, whatever, to make it into the playoffs, I like WSU and OSU's chances. You might make it into the playoffs a lot more than you ever used to. And you might become that new Boise State, that new Cincinnati, 
you know, the Utah of the past, TCU before they got into the Big 12. And there's a lot worse lives to have than that. I, there's also talk of, well, maybe you make the Big 10 and the SEC the new FBS. Then there's a, a mid-level, and then there's the FCS. So you're talking Big Sky, so Montana, Eastern Washington, Montana State, North Dakota State, teams like that. Well, if you're in that mid-tier, you could be one of the top-tier teams if you play your cards right. So I, I think the idea of time and, one, getting the extra money, but also getting two years to create a game plan of where you want to move forward is essential for Oregon State and Washington State. Let me throw you a curveball here. What do you think the odds are? I personally don't think it would happen, but um, someone had mentioned that, you know, what are the possibilities that there's there's the NFL and mm -hmm. instead of, you know, college football, now there's, you know, like a, a secondary pro league to where all the best guys from college football are now creating a second pro like league. A G league. Yeah, which is, you know, a younger version of the NFL essentially. Mm -hmm. I just think it's too uh, complicated. They would be competing with college, but yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I don't think the NFL will ever go for it because like when you look at those other leagues, your minor league system, so MLB, your triple A, double A, single A, um, NBA, G league, the NBA pays for those G league teams, right? The MLB owners have to pay for those teams. Well, as an NFL owner, why would I invest money in an 18 year old? Right when I have this perfect farm system that's already built and it doesn't cost me any money. Now, that being said, I do think that there's an opportunity for the big 10 and sec to kind of create their own 50 team super conference, if you will, where, you know, you got 25 on one side, 25 on the other. And basically you spit, you split the country in half and then you have like your Western region and then you got your Midwest and you've got your, your South and then you've got your Southeast and you've got your Northeast or whatever, right? East coast. Um, I, I think that's entirely possible. And maybe there's more NIL money that's thrown around over there. I think there's a chance that, um, you know, the FCS might become and uh, the FBS, well, they might have uh, NIL money. When I say FBS, of course, I'm meaning Mountain West, um, Conference USA, Sunbelt, the smaller group of five conferences. Um, it might be something where they combine now and you have these two tier divisions and they kind of have their own NIL rules. Like maybe there's a cap on how much NIL money a conference can have or a school can have, or, you know, like right now with the FCS to the FBS, there's different scholarship regulations. So maybe there's different scholarship regulations, but, uh, I think you're going to see a major, major change in college sports. College sports is now officially becoming um a professional league to a degree there's i think there's a chance that you might see guys who are technically enrolled at duke or enrolled at north carolina or wherever that they're not really going to school everyone knows you're there for your three years or you're there until you turn 21 and you're gone uh i i think when we look back in 10 to 15 years at what college football has become we won't even recognize it compared to today's day and age yeah. And it really, I mean, it's, you still, it's still technically, a, you know, a student athlete, but they're really an athlete student. It's like, and <clears throat> this is all based around football. It's like, you don't even consider what's going to be happening with the other sports. If you have Cal right. and Stanford on the West coast, they're the only two teams that are in the SC ACC that are on the West coast. They're going to be traveling for all of their sports. How many days off from school is that a week? Yeah. You know, the travel time, the three hour time differential and the time zones, just all these different factors that go into someone who's also trying to get a college degree. I mean, you're putting them in the worst situation possible. And mm -hmm. it's just unfortunate to see, you know, the, the big, big 10, um, looking at the map, it was definitely, and also the big 12, they're a bit closer. The ACC is mm -hmm. just. Oh, yeah. Weird, well, weird I mean, now. even the Big Ten doesn't make sense. I mean, think about it. If you're USC and you have to play a road game at Rutgers or you're Rutgers and you have to play a road oh, yeah. game at USC, yeah. that's a six-hour flight. Yeah. And, like, six-hour flight, Thursday night you fly in, Friday you're up, gone from school, that's kind of typical for college football. But you're telling me you're USC and you got to have your baseball team go all the way out to play Rutgers or Maryland? I don't know how that's feasible. I, I think there's also, a, there's a lot of talk and this is a feasible opportunity too, where, 
hey, football is its own thing. And then every other sport is back into their normal conferences. You know, um, I think there's a chance too. depending on after five to 10 years of this, if all these colleges are losing money, they're going to go, hey, man, we got to go back to what we were doing before. We got to go back to being regional. You know, we need we can't as Stanford be traveling every away game to the to the Atlantic Ocean. That just can't happen. So I, I think that there's an opportunity for some of this regression to come back. But, you know, at the end of the day, money is going to be the driving force. And the way football is king, especially college football, there's a lot of money to be had if you are in one of these now power four conferences. And it seems like it's only going to be shrinking with a lot of the top teams in the ACC wanting to make their way into the SEC. So as it shrinks, you know, are there going to be some schools that say, I'm sorry, baseball. I'm sorry, water polo. I'm sorry, diving, swimming, golfing. You don't make us any money. We are going to, you know, make all these decisions based on football. And we're going to stay and make sure that we're hitting those NCAA bylaws where we have the same amount, you know, the, the right amount of sports, Title IX in concurrent, you know, every scholarship for male athlete is every scholarship for female athlete. But we're going to start saying bye to some of these sports because there's no money to be made off them because and then everything becomes a club sport exactly you're making a ton of money off football but you're also making a ton of donations off of football and that's where the real money is because to my knowledge i don't think you're paying taxes on those because they're technically gifts i could be wrong so the donor has to free. pay the taxes i believe right so feel free to free feel free to tell me wrong if i'm wrong i'm wrong you know i'm not the that biggest right. tax lie you know, I'm not the biggest tax code guy out there, but if that's true, you start making money and you start making your decisions based on what makes you that money. And that's always going to be football. And then what's even more depressing about this is the rivalries that have been around for a hundred years, basically. You got mm-hmm. UW, WSU, you got Oregon, Oregon State, you got the the Apple Cup, the Civil War. I don't know what they're calling that now. I know they changed the, the name. I forget what it's called. I think we're going to go with platypus. The platypus bull or something like that? <laughs> it's it's the battle for the puss. I think nice. that's what they're okay. going with. <laughs> okay. It's the platy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I heard something that uh, Oregon State and Washington State need to start something called the Civil Cup because they're not, right. <laughs> they're not, they're not mad at each other. They're friends. The Apple this, War. This can be civil, but we can do a little something out of this. But if the Apple that's Cup fantastic. becomes a preseason, you know, non-meaningful game, like what is that so right well also what's why would you keep that tradition because i'll tell you right now you dub maybe for two or three years yeah sure we'll come to pullman you think after you know those two or three years you think they're going to be willing to do a home and home with wsu there's no way in hell they're going to start doing that two and one right like wsu gets colorado state at home then they go to colorado state then they get colorado state back at home at, at, at this point, it, you know, the die has been cast, so to speak, for OSU and WSU and for a lot of these old school rivalries. You were reactionary while everyone else was progressive about it. And it it sucks. And, yeah, you don't have the, the donorship uh, that like an SMU has where they can just buy their way in and they'll figure it all out later. But there were definitely steps that could have been made and should have been made. Uh, by those two universities or they could have been fought for harder to where you didn't end up in this spot now that you're in this spot you got to make you know you, you got to make some lemonade i don't know how you do it but you got to find some lemons and you got to make some lemonade it'll be really interesting really interesting to stay up on the news um you know we saw yesterday that there was the restraining order tomorrow was mm-hmm. the supposed meeting that was supposed to happen i'm sure the rest of this week will be stuff coming out um, in, in the following weeks as well. Um, really excited to see what happens with that. Um, a side thing is, is <laughs> university of Colorado for real this year. Okay. So here's my thing on them. I'm not picking them. I'm not saying that they're going to win the pac 12. I'm not saying that they're going to have a 10 win season. That offense is legit. Um, the O line still worries me. Uh, they are small, they're undersized and they don't have a lot of depth defensively. 
Nebraska, they're not very good. So you looked a lot better. Um, but when you saw them against TCU, it's a barn burner. Beauty is you got the offense that can keep up with, with it. Shador, I buy everything in him. That dude is legit. Uh, he will be a legit Heisman contender if he can stay healthy. And I think you're going to get your true real view of what Colorado is and what Colorado is going to be this year in two weeks. Um, TCU Oregon. is a right TCU. They're a good team. Um, I think they're closer to an eight and four team, maybe a nine and three team. than you know, everyone was ranking them. Everyone ranked them 17th. Like I think they ended up losing like eight guys, eight guys that were drafted, including your quarterback, your star wide receiver. It's not the same team. But this Oregon team, they should be a 10-win team. I know they struggled with Texas Tech, but they left a lot of stuff out there. This is a really, really good football team. And you're going to go on the road, and you're going to go after, you know, this, this Oregon team that has been there before. If you can go into Odson and you can beat Oregon, sky's the limits. We're now looking at you as a 10-win team. To me, I still think you fall. I think you lose to Oregon. I think you lose to Oregon State too. Oregon State just runs this bully football. <laughs> um, you're you're gonna struggle there. But I'll tell you what, man, they're entertaining as hell. I my big key to watch is Travis Hunter. If that dude can keep playing the amount of snaps that he's been playing, he's he's the biggest freak I've ever seen. He's playing two full games. I I would play games where I'd average around 65, 70 snaps. And I get it, it's a D2 football, but dude, I couldn't walk the next day. Yeah. I, like, I, I was limping into treatment. This dude played two full game equivalent, right? He's playing 120 snaps a game, and he looks amazing out there. If his body can hold up and he can do this, throw however much money you can at him in the NFL draft. Whenever he comes out, throw, throw the kitchen sink at that dude. That dude is special. Yeah, Travis Hunter, he's a cornerback and wide receiver at the University of Colorado. Um, I think he was calling himself – okay, here we go. Let me see. I'm looking up his stats. So uh, first game was 11 receptions, 119 yards. Second game against Nebraska was three receptions, 73 yards. On defense, three tackles the first game, one interception, four tackles the second game. But, yeah, I mean, playing offense and defense, especially – I mean, any position, let alone – cornerback wide receiver where you're sprinting every every down mm -hmm. i mean that's just insane right and his interception oh my god <laughs> guys don't make that play you you are beat in against most corners most elite corners that's a touchdown you're a special cat if you can make us if you can swat that ball down if you can knock it down but to be able to leap you know four yards the way he did get in front of that ball get that interception I don't know how you find a dude with that kind of talent. And let's call a spade a spade. He really should have another touchdown receiving. He dropped a touchdown where he – it was a tough diving catch, but he probably should have had it. And he dropped another interception that hit him in the hands. So let's not act like, while as impressive as he is, he's this polished specimen. He's still a little raw. He's which a sophomore. Is incredible to – exactly. He's 19. That's yeah. incredible to say about a 19-year-old is he's the best player on the field in every game that he goes out in because of how good of a player he is in, at corner and at wide receiver. But there's still a lot of room for growth. And there will be that growth because he's being coached by the greatest cornerback ever or arguably the greatest cornerback ever. And then wide receiver, you're just going to get better the more reps you see. So this dude hasn't even come close to hitting his ceiling. He is going to be special special and i forget what interview it was but he was talking about um it was either him or someone talking about him about being in the heisman heisman watch and mm -hmm. that would that'd be really, really interesting to see a two-way guy be able to take that award um and then of course you know is it shadur how do you say that uh shadur yeah shadur yeah he's gonna be yeah. in the conversation um of course cam williams usc various uh michael Penix. i mean yeah the uh, pack, the Pac-12 this year is going to be a lot of fun to watch. Oh, yeah. The quarterback play, well, I mean, we just went through, uh, you know, Caleb Williams is going to be the favorite. Then you're looking at Penix, who I, I know is just shooting up 
ranks as he's slinging that ball around. Bo Nix won Oregon their game on Saturday. If they don't have Bo Nix, they don't win that game. He put that team on his back when nothing was going well for them, and he made it work, and he made it work with his arm and with his leg legs, right? So he can figure that out. Shadur, he's got 900 yards passing in two games. If he's not number one in the country, he's got to be top five. The dude is slinging it, and he's able to do – you know, he's making all the throws. He's making long throws, medium throws, short throws. When he has to run, he can run. He's a competent quarterback, and he's out there killing it. You haven't even gone to mention Cam Ward. Cam Ward looked fantastic against Wisconsin, a quality defense. Yes, it was at home, but his growth from the year before to this year against Wisconsin, who both times they were a ranked team with a vastly superior defense than what he is used to facing in the Pac-12. Sorry, spade a spade is what it is. His growth was incredible. He was slinging the ball around. He can win it with his feet and with his arm, but he's also making better passing decisions. He's not just taking risks or when he gets into trouble, chucking the ball up. He's not making as many bad decisions as he has in the past. That impresses me. Oh, by the way, DJ Ui Ungalale, the more troubles that they have at Clemson, that dude looks better and better. Clemson got blown out by Duke. DJ went out and blew out San Jose State. Yeah, his next game is against UC Davis, but he gets the job done. And now you start looking back at last year with all the Clemson offensive struggles and you start to go, that might not have been on DJU. Yeah, he has some issues with accuracy, especially when he's throwing that medium route, you know, that ball anywhere from 8 to 15. It seems like he's gotten a little bit better, but he still has the struggles at that. All of a sudden, I'm now wondering if it was more on Clemson play calling than it was himself. Oh, and we haven't mentioned Cam Rising, who is out with an ACL for Utah. But the dude's an absolute freaking hoss. And once he does get back, that's going to catapult that Utah team into Pac-12 title considerations. And they're the two-time defending Pac-12 champions. So at least we can say that the last dance is going to be fun as hell. Absolutely. I mean, the talent is all there. That's where it's like... I need to make a video on this separately, but Washington State University and OSU, we've already talked about this, but talent-wise they need to be in a top conference. You know, like yeah. Dylan said, they come in with lower ranked recruits every year, like three stars going against the five stars at Oregon and these other places every year. And they always seem to pull off the upsets and, and, you know, come in the underdogs and they're really not the underdogs. It seems. But. Right. Well, I'll tell you right now, Oregon state and WSU with these coaching staffs are starting to recruit at a higher level. You're starting to see them get some of those four star kids. And the big one right now, you got to start paying attention to Aiden Childs out at OSU. The kid just turned 18. He is the backup to DJU. He's already thrown for two touchdowns, yes, against twos in garbage time. But what kind of 18-year-old is doing that? And everyone is saying that he was a late riser. I trust Andrew Nemec. He's uh, you know the head recruiter, I think, at 24-7 Sports. The guy's a stud. He knows everything there is to know about high school recruiting, college recruiting, and he just speaks the world of Aiden Childs, and you can see it. I mean, he went to the Ar – I think he went to the Army All-American game. I think that was his bowl game. Oh, yep. He was the MVP. He was the best player out there, and he's the youngest. So what is that kid going to turn into under Jonathan Smith, a, a coach that's made an Oregon State program – I mean, shoot, they won 10 games last year, and you can make the argument they didn't have a quarterback. They won 10 games last year just running the football. So now that he's starting to get competent QB play, not just from DJU, but from his backup, and that kid's only going to grow, I mean, you're talking about a legit three- to four-year run here where Oregon State's going to be in the mix every single year, no matter what conference they're in. Yeah, and I mean, eight Pac-12 schools are ranked right now. So Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, UCLA, they got Dante Moore, the number one, two, or three quarterback, depending on the ranking systems you're looking at. True <laughs> freshman, kid slinging it in Chip Kelly system, the guy who created Marcus Mariota. Yeah, because, I, and I, I, we had talked about this briefly before, but it seems that every year the Pac 12 just kind of eats itself apart because there's always great competition. You know, the underdog seems to pull it off quite a few times throughout, throughout the year with the Pac 12 versus. Other conferences like the SEC, maybe not quite as much. Do you right. see that things are more top-heavy in other conferences versus 
something like the Pac-12? Well, I think there's a true regression in the SEC. Um, I think for a long time, it was the SEC and everyone else. Um, and this isn't like a whole like Texas is back type thing, but George is the number one team in the country far and away. But when you look at the teams who are vying for that number two spot in that conference and possibly number two nationally, LSU went out and laid an absolute egg against FSU. You know, if they had if they had finished on a couple drives, maybe that game is different. Here's the thing. You didn't. You got beat by FSU and you got beat pretty badly. You look at this Alabama team. That's the worst Alabama loss at home in the Nick Saban era. You lost by 10 to Texas. Now, a lot of people do think that Texas is back. And look, I think Texas is going to have a real good shot at going to the playoff. You look at the rest of their schedule, they're going to face two ranked teams total. But you still have to be really good. And they found a competent QB and a really good QB in Quinn Ewers. I think the SEC has taken a step back. When I look at the other conferences, Big 12, who do I really think can challenge this Texas team? Oklahoma, maybe, if Venerables gets that team right. but. Last year, you saw some true struggles. So, you know, when I look at the Big 12, I almost kind of look at it as Texas up here and everyone else down here the same way I look at the SEC. You look at the Big 10, Michigan can win it, Penn State can win it, and maybe Ohio State can win it. But when I've watched Ohio State so far, I haven't been sold on their QB play. Michigan is always going to be a ground and pound type team, and they're going to beat you into submission. But we've seen that when they get into the playoffs, they've had issues. So. When I look at the Pac-12 and I go down it and I think I can make a legit argument for about six to seven teams to win the conference, they're easily the deepest conference. And I think the Big Ten is the only one that even has an ability to hold a candle to them in, hey, look at how good our two, three, four are, right? So I, I, you've never seen a deeper conference. It's a little bit dumb luck. But if you are going to go out, go out on a bang. Blow that thing up. Make everyone remember you. Do the Aaron Rodgers. Run out of the tunnel with the American flag. Have the national anthem playing behind you and then tear your Achilles. Everyone <laughs> will remember you and talk about, wow, how great you could have been. Yeah. Talk about what it could have been. <laughs> right. Well, uh, really appreciate your time. Um, another great chat, talking football. Let's definitely uh, plan to do this on a weekly basis. Uh, we'll connect again. And uh, yeah, thanks again for your time. Dude, thank, thank you so much for having me. I love talking college football. Uh, clearly probably talked a little bit too much for my own good, but thanks for One, one me more question, here. actually. One more yeah. question. What All does right. your Saturday look like? Because you know everything about college football. You know, <laughs> I try to watch the Q game. I try to watch some other big games, but yeah. I mean, what does that look like? I need to, I need to go watch some highlights on these guys. You know everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so I work, I work for the Ducks. So, um, whenever the Ducks play is kind of how my Saturday is based. Um, so this last weekend, uh, ironically, I was actually at my brother's engagement party. Um, so what I did is, while everyone else was kind of doing the engagement party things, uh, I had the Duck game on one TV. I had uh, my laptop up, and so I had Alabama, Texas on that. I had another laptop up watching Wisconsin, WSU. And so I was kind of doing like a little three, like a little lizard thing where like yeah. one eye's here, one eye's yeah. there, you know, trying to find another way to get uh, the other game. And then when I go into the station to work, I've got about four or five different TVs in there. So I can put on, uh, you know, one game here, one game there, one game behind me. I've got a game on my computer. Um, and then, and then I watch a lot of highlights. Like I said, it's, it's probably a scary addiction. Um, it's like <laughs> a good thing. I never got into drugs. Or There's still anything time. Anything else. Right? <laughs> like, like my addiction is like, I watch too much football. <laughs> yeah. I'm the but, same uh, way with baseball. I, I got the four screens on. It. Yeah. Dude, you, dude, you have to, right. It's uh it's why I like going up to the, the casino and watching games at the sports book. I'm going to have four or five TVs. I can get the gist of what I need. I'm going to read two or three things every single day. There's a couple different sports podcasts that I like to listen to where I trust what I'm getting out of guys. And then I'm also following a bunch of, uh, you know, beat writers and stuff like that on X and Instagram. And so it's like, what can I read? What can I see? Um, it's probably why I'm single, but <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, uh, 
You know what? Everyone has their hobbies. Mine just happens to be an unhealthy addiction to uh, a pigskin. <laughs> and you just happen to make it a career. So it's the perfect, Trying, yeah. perfect route. Um, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, yeah, again, thanks. Thanks for your time. We'll uh, do it again soon. Dude, thank you so much for having me. All right. Love being a part of it.